New York. And uh, I wrote a book about that called The Neighborhood Project. And I described Dan in that book as uh, the quintessential good kid with a mind like a Maserati per his hood. I'm not sure you remember that, Dan, but... Uh, uh, I, I'd possibly intentionally forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so uh, and after doing such wonderful work in Binghamton, you on your own initiative went to Boston and worked with um, the Harvard sociologists, uh, uh, Christopher Winship and Robert Sampson to start the Boston Area Research Initiative, which eventually moved with you to Northeastern University. And I've done such amazing things in the city of Boston, which I regard as as just the just the best example of what a smart city movement can um, can um, can be like. And so I'm so impressed by what has taken place there. And and Kim uh, Lucas, you were part of the Bari, and on the website you are described as an academic practitioner who is committed to community-driven civic research, innovation in city university collaborations, and leveraging our collective expertise for the social good. And both of you featured here, um, for um, which, will, which will be recorded. And with that, please take it away. Sure thing. Well, well, thank you so much, David, and thank you, Pro Social World World, um, for for having us today. Uh, we're really excited to be able to share our work. So let me share my screen. Um, make sure the whole thing comes across. Oh, you're getting a preview there. Oh, that's not what we wanted. We want this. There we go. All right. Can everyone see? Um, my screen? Yep. So all right, great. So we wanted to sort of introduce you to the Bar Boston Area Research Initiative, also known as BARI. Uh, we do not go by Barry, uh, and that's because, well, we have an old colleague whose name is Barry, and early on we decided there was going to be a need for disambiguation. So uh, we're going to talk a bit about BARI and what we try to do. And so the original title for this talk and the one on the website was Integrating Data and Research with Community. But as Kim and I have been putting the slides together over the last couple of days, I um, thought maybe a pithier kind of summary of what we're going to talk about today is In Pursuit of Civic Research. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about the center, the, the vision of what we're doing. And you know, this is sort of a, a, a slightly different talk than either one of us typically gives. I think it cobbles things together that we often do. But knowing that this community's real focus is sort of um, different ways to kind of build and structure and coordinate and, and gather institutions to operate in pro-social manners, right? Uh, it, the biologists in the crowd might appreciate that as kind of a, you know, trying to force a, a new a new scale of evolution. Um, David, I remember those things, uh, even though I'm I'm here in public policy. Uh, you know, I, I think that this this might be a fun way of thinking about that uh, and how we we work on things. That's what we're focusing on today. Um, so with that, Bari, who are we? What do we do? And and what is this idea of civic research that we're we're getting at here? Um, so. Just as, as a starter, right, our mission statement, because I, I feel like that's a, a fun way to or a useful way to start. Like, what are we? So we advance civically engaged research that leverages data to pursue social, economic and environmental justice in partnership with the communities of greater Boston. Right? That That is the vision. That's the mission. And, and there's a good amount to unpack there. Right. Civically engaged research. We'll talk about that a lot more. Leveraging data. Uh, so I think when Bari first started, we were we were founded on the premise of there was this opportunity at the intersection of research policy and big data. And I, as a uh, as a data nerd and a bit of a code monkey at times, uh, really kind of took that mantle on in digging into administrative records, social media, all sorts of other stuff, along with colleagues. But I think we've gotten really expansive over the years. And you know, Kim will talk a bit more about this. Uh, her her experiences and expertise is more so in qualitative and uh, really digging in on, on that sort of perspective. And so I think as a center, we've become increasingly sort of um, Catholic, if you will, uh, in in the range of data that we think of as relevant um, or at least invest in ourselves. And we do that for a purpose, right? And this is really, you know, to go to David's point about smart cities initiatives and how there's a bunch of them 
around the world doing different things. I do think in a way that we are distinctive from a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them in having a mission, right? Especially in the early days, smart cities initiatives were kind of like, you know, have solution, find problem, uh, and not necessarily mission driven. Whereas we've been very driven around right, trying to help uh, and, and collaborate with our neighbors to figure out what it is, what it is we want society to look like. And then leveraging technology and data to get there rather than doing what the data and technology, what the next innovation might be suggested to be, and then kind of imposing that in some way. Um, and we've we've centered this around um, social, economic, and environmental justice. And then in partnership with local communities, right? We are a locally based uh, effort. Um, and and we always have to note this, right? We have a primary focus on Greater Boston. That's where our collaborations are. That's where our partners often are. Though we we hope that we act as a model for cities across the country and world, and we try to participate in consortia of like-minded city university kind of infrastructures and partnerships um, so that some of the things that we learn here can go there and some of the things folks learn in other places we can bring here. Um, and you can learn more about us at our website, uh, if you get a chance, um, you can dig around a little bit and see more about what we've been up to. So with that as a mission, right, I, I always love to kind of distinguish between a mission and actual activities. You know, the, the activities are how you get there. Uh, and in a sense, Bari is simultaneously a center and a consortium. Uh, and, and what that means is, right, on the one end, we're we're a center, right? We have these civic research partnerships, but, you know, all academic centers or most academic centers are structured in such a way that you have a cadre of faculty and their students and other staff, uh, postdocs, so on and so forth, working on projects, right? Those projects could be internal. Those projects could be with external partners. In our case, they take the form of these civic research partnerships, like the example I have there. Uh, that's a book I published uh, a few years ago on the urban commons, which grew out of a long-term collaboration with the city of Boston on its 311 system and, and how people do and do not, for that matter, call in issues in public spaces. And that's that's a research project, right? And that's that's the bread and butter of a, of a center typically. But, you know, we also operate as a consortium because Boston has a lot of a lot, a lot of people interested in civic research and a lot, a lot, a lot of institutions with the horsepower and the, the resources and the personnel to really go after that mission. And so we dedicated ourselves from the beginning to trying to set the table for that community um, and really helping to bring it together and allowing that community to see itself as a community and to work together and to build things together. And so the, the high point of this is our annual conference, uh, which to our understanding is the only conference of its type in the world that happens every year. Instead of bringing together all the sociologists or all the evolutionists or all of the psychologists or social psychologists, we bring together everyone in greater Boston who is interested in civic research. And that includes academics, it includes policymakers, it includes other appointed officials, it includes nonprofits, it includes local foundations, it includes community um, advocates, right? A whole spectrum of folks who some of them may be data scientists and others may know data are out there and know that it's relevant to how they interact with community every day and everything in between. And so, and that is collectively governed. We have a conference committee of uh, 12 people, I think, all from different institutions. So right, very different from a standard center. And then in between, we have two other activities. One is our Boston data portal, probably a little closer to your standard civic research partnership, write a paper, you know, put it out there. This is we where we publish our data sets um, and we try to make them available as much as possible uh, to the general public um, to use in their own work, whether that be other academics who want to do research and it saves them hundreds of hours of time to prepare the data. Or we have a, even a point and click map where if you're a community organization and you're trying to write a grant, um, the data on your community are there and you can go dig into that. Um, but then a little bit closer to the consortium side of things, we do a lot of public education and we've been investing a lot in this concept of civic research agendas. Uh, and the public education side is a little bit more stand and deliver, right? We do trainings with community organizations on using the Boston Data Portal. Uh, we have a new program that started this spring 
where we're working in local high schools um, and primarily high schools that that serve underprivileged communities uh, to teach basics of data science uh, using Boston-based data. And, and it really kind of takes the Boston data portal from being a platform to being uh, a resource that people know how to use and, and gets invest in, um, yeah, internalized uh, and and um, utilized better. And then we also have these civic research agendas, um, which Kim will talk a lot more about, but this idea of bringing together multiple institutions, not just for a yearly conference where hundreds of people come together and hang out and chat for a day, but really kickstarting a concentrated conversation between institutions focused on the same thing or things. And we've done them on housing. That's actually an example from one of our workshops on housing. And then the most prominent example of this is one that Kim has led on the early childhood agenda, uh, which is, um, she'll get the numbers better, but I believe it was over 2000 um, different individuals and institutions input into this uh, agenda for what should this community be doing together to advance early childhood care and education in Massachusetts. So, so that's that's what we do, and and that's our broader vision in a nutshell. Uh, so for for the purpose of this talk, what I want to do is I want to talk first about the center. I'm going to give an example of a civic research partnership, and then I'm going to talk briefly about the conference as sort of the the counterpart to that at the consortium level, and then I'm going to turn it over to Kim, who's going to talk extensively, particularly about the civic research agendas um, and how they work. We thought that those three things would be the most kind of compelling narrative for today. We're not really going to talk much about the Boston Data Portal. We won't talk too much about the other public education programming, but we, we're going to have time for conversation. So if people want to talk more about those, uh, we can certainly do that. All right, with that, off to the races. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about a project that has become really prominent uh, at the center uh, called Common Senses as an example of civic research in action. Um, so Common Senses, it is... It, this was done in collaboration with engineers and was funded in part by an NSF grant from an engineering, uh, well, uh, the engineering directorate, uh, for which reason it has to be an acronym uh, and an acronym that believes itself to be relatively clever. Um, but it stands for Standards for Enacting Sensor Networks for an Equitable Society. And in some ways, the inspiration here was we've got these cool technologies, these sensor systems that we can put all over the place and they can track heat, they can track air pollution, they can track flooding, noise, light, precipitation, et cetera. Um, but you know, the, the corporations that have built those, the tech corporations have basically said, it'll tell you what you need to know. But there was no logic or no process for turning it into public infrastructure and really telling municipalities and communities what they need to know. Um, so this idea um, then was sort of informed by um, a kind of a more academic concept I've been dabbling in over the last couple of years about addressing microspatial inequities, right? And so conceptually, if we go back to the beginning of urban science, we go back to folks like W.E.B. Du Bois and the Chicago School of Sociology, urban science almost exclusively has focused on neighborhoods as if neighborhoods were the kind of natural social structure of humans, right? The Chicago School of Sociology essentially talked about neighborhoods as, as the old village, you know, that had been kind of moved to urban areas because everyone moved to urban areas. And then, right, a neighborhood is just a village. And then a city is just a agglomeration of uh, villages. Um, and, you know, this has actually been a really effective line of research. I don't want to besmirch it too much. I've contributed to it myself. David has as well. Um, but this idea that neighborhoods really matter for residents, right? The neighborhood effect. And you can see these examples over the last, you know, 150 years of research on this. And, and there's, there's a lot of good evidence for it. Everything from Raj Chetty's work on mobility to Rob Sampson's and his colleagues' extensive work in Chicago on crime, public health, education. So lots of evidence there. But, 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 there are processes that operate at other levels as well. And, and my concern, I think the concern, it's funny, actually, a paper just came out about this in a planning journal three days ago uh, that I saw. Uh, a lot of, it's becoming more and more apparent that um, that thinking 
is great, but it has the tendency, as academics do, to ignore the other things, right? Once you commit to a scale, you forget that maybe some things are happening at a lower level. Um, and so what about street to street? What about building to building? Are there these ecological differences that are going to matter? Um, and I make the argument that microspatial inequities have been overlooked. And I've got a picture of a pointillistic painting on there. Um, that's a longer trope that I'm going to sidestep today. But just this idea that, right, we can see the image, but then you can drill down and drill down and drill down to really get at some other things that are also occurring. In the case of pointillistic painting, the dots have different colors and shapes and so on and so forth that then create the broader image that we're, we're perceiving in a neighborhood, like on the left there, you know, you have blocks and you have even buildings that differ from each other in ways that are consequential. Now, we also have this explosion of technology and data for the hyperlocal. We have these sensors. We have other forms of data that can capture things happening at these lower levels that really was never possible before. And that's an important distinction, right? It's easy to get caught in a single scale if you can't look at any other scale because of the nature of data that you have. And so this is an important advent that we have available to us right now. And then my argument is that if we put this all together, this thinking plus these data, we can drive new approaches to equitable design, implementations, and impact that really engage with and consider microspatial inequities as a meaningful factor in the urban landscape or just community landscapes in general. It doesn't need to be urban. All right, so where do we go from there, right? How do we turn that from insight into impact? In that sense, then each community is going to need its own science-driven solutions that are going to respond to the local geography, address the underlying processes, right? It's not enough to know that microspatial inequities exist. What's really important is to understand the processes that are driving those microspatial inequities. And then reflect the values and priorities held by the residents themselves, right? This needs to be a co-designed process, it needs to be a participatory process where the residents are able to see their own landscape and, and speak to what they would like to do with that landscape. Um, and that's really important because once you get into the particularities of block by block differences, residents are going to have very clear understanding of what's going on in that block to block context, even if they're learning something from the data there are other things that are not in the data that they know that get lost when you're dealing at neighborhood level generalities. Okay, so we put together a transdisciplinary research team. Um, we're not quite this segregated, but, but it's fun to tell this story in terms of segregating our roles very clearly because I think this is actually a really well-built team. My colleague Amy is an engineer whose um, expertise is environmental sensors. Uh, I do urban informatics, basically I turn data on communities um, into, I hope, interesting stuff. Uh, my colleague Moira Zellner is an expert in participatory modeling and kind of bringing complex data in accessible ways to communities uh, and, and initiating conversations with them that can then sort of build the next step. And my colleague Michelle Leboy. Uh, is an architect whose expertise is in green infrastructure and thinking about ways to build kind of decentralized interventions throughout communities and, and municipalities. And our strategy is essentially put environmental sensors up that will track the hyperlocal hazards, be they pollution, be they uh, flooding, be they heat otherwise, Build new AI modeling and interpolation tools that can then make for really precise spatiotemporal maps of hazards. And I'm talking like you could really track day to day which street is experiencing what or even within a day and really getting at those um, models effectively. And then we need a framework uh, for drivers and consequences of these inequities. Where do they come from? What are the processes we need to interrupt if we're going to support a community? But also, what are their consequences and for whom and why? And then that will lead to strategies for mitigation and adaptation, a toolbox, if you will, that can then be incorporated into participatory modeling tools and workshops, where you can have conversations about what does the community's landscape look like? How does it feel? How is it experienced? And what are some strategies for mitigating, right? What are some strategies for adapting to this, these circumstances? And how are those, or how are they not, 
the things that the community wants. And you do that through kind of these clever modeling platforms that Moira and her team have built. And then in this particular project, we're focusing on green infrastructure installations, right? What are the kinds of things you could implement in a neighborhood, especially when you're building something already? And as I'll, I'll elaborate here, we have two example projects that are already funded that are focused on particular building projects. So the first one is in the city of Chelsea, which is just north of Boston. It is a majority Latinx community. Uh, it is historically disadvantaged, historically um, home to immigrants, even before, uh, you know, before it became a Latinx community or predominantly Latinx community, it was a predominantly Italian community when the Italians were the immigrants, right, and so on and so forth. So it's been historically in, in, in a home to immigrants, uh, and so has a very high density, it has extreme heat, it's right on the water, uh, it floods in quite a few places, it's it's not even bisected. It's kind of trisected or more by a bunch of highways and major thoroughfares that lead into Boston, creating lots of highway pollution. There's also a lot of industry there. And so there's a lot of industrial pollution um, and so on and so forth. Right. So every hazard that you can imagine as being part of the urban experience, a negative part of the urban experience is concentrated in Chelsea. And we received a uh, an award from the American Institute of Architects called the Latrobe Prize. Uh, this is an award that they give out to one team every two years. Uh, we received um, from them in 2022, uh, and it comes with some funding, to work with the city of Chelsea to have a conversation. Um, and you see that little pink lavender kind of polygon down on the bottom of the screen there to to engage with the city and with the abutters to that parcel on a major uh, reconstruction project there. Uh, they are turning a, a freight, a really decrepit freight warehouse into a less decrepit freight warehouse. Uh, and we're, we're working with them on the conversations that occur around that regarding the current environmental circumstances there and how they might change. And it's actually really important. There's a park across the street. There's a Boys and Girls Club next door. There's a housing development uh, next door to the Boys and Girls Club. There's a lot of really sensitive contexts right around this building. And so this can be a really sort of valuable way to think about architecture's uh, impact on the community around it um, and, and the microspatial sort of environmental dynamics that go with it. The other one, a bit more ambitious, this is funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, there is a major thoroughfare, probably about, starts about half a mile from my office over here, um, called Blue Hill Avenue. It runs through the heart of Black Boston, uh, runs all the way down kind of the bottom two thirds of the city. Uh, and there's a housing action plan occurring there. So a lot of Blue Hill Ave has suffered from disinvestment over the years. And there's a bunch of abandoned parcels that have um, have fallen to the city's ownership and the city is placing housing on those parcels. And the question is, well, what housing and why? And will there be green infrastructure around it? And are these the things that the community wants? Or even could some of these things create more air pollution on the street, right? Based on traffic or parking, so on and so forth. And so really having those conversations in an in-depth way with community um, is the focus of this project. And it's a collaboration between us, the Mayor's Office of Newer Mechanics, which is a, kind of an innovation shop at the city of Boston, which not exactly coincidentally, uh, Kim Lucas uh, also worked for uh, for quite a while. Um, the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, which is a neighborhood, it's a collective land trust, actually, for those who know what that is. Uh, it's a a piece of land that's owned by the organization and then by all the members of the organization therein, um, sort of a way to um, manage land prices uh, and, and maintain and, and protect diversity in the neighborhood in a lot of ways and, and really support home ownership in a lower income community. Uh, and Project Right, which is um, an amalgam of institutions in a neighborhood right alongside it called Grove Hall. And so all of these partners, and we're actually gaining partners by the day, um, are working together on this. Um, and we're actually, this is where we're engaging the high school students. We're teaching them about environmental justice through data. And we're training them so that this summer they're going to do internships with us. And they're going to be doing outreach. And they're going to be technology and data and environmental justice translators for their neighbors and their peers. Uh, so this is a project we're 
extremely excited about. And this whole sort of area and idea is something we're, we're really excited about and working a lot on right now. It's become a real focus of the research angle of Bari over the last uh, year or so. Um, and all of this, stay tuned. Um, I have a I have a book coming out with MIT Press probably next year on this whole idea. Uh, it's called The Pontalistic City, um, but this whole idea of microspatial inequities. Um, and it covers a lot of stuff that I didn't talk about here. Um, but just to kind of capture for you all, right, the civic research purpose here of local versus global, right? Because a lot of what we're doing is going to have very important impacts, but only locally, right? Understanding of the hazard landscape. That is a value to the people of Blue Hill. That is a value to the people uh, in that uh, corner of Chelsea. It's not necessarily a generalized impact. It's not advancing science more broadly, but it has real local value. And the community-led data-driven solutions that come out of it, again, real local value, not necessarily generalizable on their own, but it's an important aspect of what we might call action research. But in the global sense, this is generating theories and models of hyperlocal hazards, things that could be generalized, things that could be extended to other contexts. Um, and we are actively seeking out additional projects um, and in other locales to continue building sort of the the full the full portfolio of of places that we've collaborated with this with in this way, and then that will further extend the generalizability of the theories and the models. Very similar to the way Eleanor Ostrom has just produced just binders upon binders of different projects that she and her colleagues worked with on managing the commons. And then there'll also be similarly a toolbox of strategies for microspatial inequities. And, and we're working towards a playbook here, a common senses playbook that will be kind of a living document that will continue to evolve, that will describe to others who want to do this sort of work, all the different things we've tried and what worked and what didn't and how it all comes together. So, so there's a real, I think, a real value here to the idea of civic research having local impact, but global potential. Okay. So that's our, our research example here. I'm gonna talk pretty quickly and much more succinctly about the conference. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Kim to talk about civic research agendas uh, as, as something kind of in between these two things. But our annual conference is, as I mentioned, uh, we think it's unique in the world to bring together the full civic research community of a single region to talk to each other about their work. Um, and we finally converged on an annual title, which is Greater Boston's Annual Insight to Impact Summit. And it attracts some, this year we had over 300 people there. Uh, we had over 70 speakers. Um, we had a keynote from a local foundation. We had, um, we had 12 other panels that covered topics from transportation to race, identity, and opportunity to digital equity to, um, to just the process of innovation in this space, to housing, so on and so forth. We we covered the gamut of what the community tells us to do. Um, and so I thought it'd be fun to just give you a brief history of how this, this institution, as it were, came to be. And it started in 2011 when Bari started. This was before Bari even existed. Uh, Bari was founded out of an inaugural conference that essentially asked the question, is there a civic research community, right? Is there even a conversation to be had here? And in fact, the the fun history of this was I was hired as kind of a postdoc to help plan this conference. And I was told in no uncertain terms, if this works, there's a job here for you. And if this doesn't work, there's no job for you to want. Uh, and so we worked really hard to see if there was such a community and 450 people showed up. Uh, and this was at Harvard. Uh, so there's a certain clout there and we, we, it was a gilded conference. We brought in all sorts of really prominent speakers from around the world with a budget that I never got to see. And I don't know that I ever want to, um, you know, that, uh, we, we managed to put this pretty, uh, ambitious thing together, uh, in 2011. And from there, Bari was born. Um, but then the conference thing kind of went to the wayside. We thought that the civic research community would then start humming on its own. Um, but in 2014, we had a new mayor. Uh, mayor Menino, who had been the longest um, serving mayor in the country, uh, 
stepped down. He, he chose not to run again. Uh, he had an approval rating of 85%. So I would call that just stepping down from, you know, appointment for life. Uh, but one way or another, we had a new mayor and it became clear the new mayor didn't fully understand this mission, didn't fully understand this vision. And we needed, and not even he, but his, his staff and the team he had built around him needed to be sort of pulled into the conversation. And so we hosted a second conference in 2014, where we tried to reestablish the civic research community in the context of a new mayoral administration. And he actually gave the keynote talk, which was great. And it was really, it was a wonderful day. And I think it kicked off. There was some carryover from the Menino to the Walsh administrations, but to really kick off kind of the moment, getting that momentum going again. Right. 2017, um, I was given the keys to the car and made director of the center, moved the center over to Northeastern. And one of my first things I wanted to do was establish an annual conference that raised a mirror to the civic research community. Right. Instead of curating panels to speak at the civic research community, we did what most academic conferences do, which is invite speakers to propose what they want to talk about and then put that together into panels and have a day that is generated from the grassroots, right? It is the conversation or the series of conversations that the community wants to be having with each other. Uh, and so this was the first time we tried this uh, and and it went fine. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a mind bogglingly good conference, but it was the first time we tried it and, and enough people showed up. They were like, okay, we'll do it again. And we kept it going. Um, Fourth annual conference, we survived by doing a pandemic pivot. We did a weekly seminar, a weekly webinar instead for the for like 18 weeks, which was possibly one of the most ambitious. And yeah, I was tired by the end of that. Uh, that was that was quite the effort. Um, fifth annual conference marked our, our 10th anniversary. Um, and this year we had our seventh annual conference. And the format has more or less stayed a lot the same over the years. One of the things we've really sought to do in the last two years, and I'll, I'm going to give Kim a lot of credit for this, as she's been integrally involved in those last two years and really helping think about how do we get community more involved? The original idea of civic research community, we weren't even using those terms, um, but the original idea when we started was university and city need to work together. And over the years, we became more and more aware that it needed to be more than just university and city. It needed to be nonprofits. It needed to be community advocates. It needed to be practitioners. Um, and we've had to figure out how do you get those folks in the room, especially if they don't have research projects they want to talk about. And so I think we've we've really come around to doing quite a good job at that. And the last two years, we experimented with a whole bunch of formatting. And this year, we tried something new that I think really worked well where every panel started with a moderator and then some research talks, kind of standard. The moderator was pretty institutional. We often had someone from government. Uh, but then we had a provocateur on the back side of the panel. And the provocateur was there to basically say, hey, that's a nice regression model you got there. What does it mean for my community? Right? What does it mean for the people that I talk to every day? Or even saying, like, there's a question that's missing here that really needs to be the next thing you work on, or we need to get this to implementation, right? That's a cool insight, but what do we do with it? Where is the impact? I don't see it yet. And we need to work together on this. And, you know, from all we've heard from um, conference goers uh, since, since we did this in April um, has been that that really helped to kind of pivot the conversation from being a Q and A where like, okay, how did you do that to each individual panelist to a real robust conversation within the room of all of these people, all of whom have their own expertise going back and forth about what do we do next and what do we do together? And it was just a vibrant day. Um, and I think we've really, you know, we're always going to iterate. We're always going to try new things. And there's probably things that we didn't think went perfectly that I'm just not telling you about, but we really think that we, we found a good model, have, have evolved to a good model or developed to a good model here in terms of how to get a diverse community with diverse expertises to really talk to each other and respect each other's perspectives um, in a way that's going to create real synergies. Um, so, so yeah, so that's a summary of our, our conferences. And so from there, I'm going to turn over to civic research agendas and I'm going to give the floor to Kim. Kim, do you want me to keep running animations or do you want to take over screen share and, and control it? Uh, you can you can continue. We don't need to get too wild with the Zoom tech. Um, okay. 
but cool. Um, thanks, Dan. This is a good segue into civic research agendas. So I'm going to talk about civic research agendas in the context that, you know, Dan showed you the continuum between, you know, the, the lab idea and the center idea and then all the way to the conference idea um, and uh, position civic research agendas in the middle. And I just want to uh, challenge everyone here to think about positioning civic research agendas in between both ways, right? And so if you think about uh, moving from a kind of uh, traditional lab, traditional center in an in academic institution, all the way out to what moves us to a more collaborative sense uh, in working with our colleagues, civic research agendas is one tool um, to be able to do that. The other way around works too. Um, conferences are oftentimes points where we're sharing about the work that we're doing, but they're also points where we can come together and identify what we would like to do next. And so civic research agendas come into play in that moment too, swinging into, oh, wow, we've identified maybe common projects, maybe just common questions, maybe that's it, um, that we all wanna ask, and that should feed into our respective lab work and our respective center work and, and what that looks looks like. So it, it kind of sits in the middle both ways. Uh, that said, you know, the I'll walk you all through the history of civic research agendas and the work that I've been focused on with this, uh, and then talk about where we've landed most recently. Um, and then that's it. I think then we'll we'll open it up to questions and I'll just kind of be the rounding out of this this talk. Um, a little research, uh, research, a little information about me before I launch into the the kind of history of civic research agendas and, and where we are now um, that may be helpful, right? So I am a professor of the practice. I'm uh, a, an associate director at uh, Bari as well, uh, and I work with Dan uh, at the School of Public Policy. And professor of the practice positions uh, are such that uh, I did not work in academia before, although I am trained as an economic sociologist and, as Dan mentioned, a qualitative person at that. Um, my experience really has been focused on working either for or with institutions. Uh, and so uh, Dan alluded to this, but I spent five years working here in Boston uh, under then Mayor Walsh. Uh, and so as the Bari conference was picking up as a, an annual conference, as Dan mentioned. I was on the other side of that, working in Mayor Walsh's administration at the mayor's office and trying to think about, okay, what is our role in this ecosystem? What is our role in this space? How do we both support but also just participate as government folks? Um, and so some of the work that I did in that capacity was really finding out who are the nerds who sit in City Hall, and who are the folks who either have PhDs or think long and deeply about the work that they do, and maybe even have their own research questions. And they may not call them research questions, but they are research questions nonetheless. Um, and so I spent five years doing that. I spent a couple of years working at the national level, looking at partnerships between uh, city governments and universities uh, and supporting those various partnerships across the landscape um, and have recently landed at Northeastern. Um, and so in the next slide, I'll just kind of walk you through a history of civic research agendas that parallels that my kind of movement in this space as well. So uh, the next slide should show in 2018. So 2018, as mentioned, I was working uh, at the mayor's office of new urban mechanics, which is an office that sits within the mayor's office uh, at the city of Boston, they still exist. Um, and my task as the then civic research director was to figure out what our questions were. Um, just as an office, as an 11 person office, what were our questions? And I worked with my internal staff to figure out those lingering questions, those big picture questions that we wanted to tackle, those kind of like theoretical questions that we needed as proof of concept so that we could start a new project. And then maybe those in time questions, so the more empirical questions that maybe the common senses lab might be able to directly answer, right? Um, and to suss out and, and, and really figure this out. 
why did I do this? The reason for this was because our partners, uh, right? And imagine I'm sitting in local government, I'm sitting at the mayor's office and our partners who were then, at least for me, all external partners. In the city of Boston, we have 34 colleges and universities in the city proper. And I was interfacing with folks from a majority of these colleges and universities. And collectively, our partners said, what's important? I get it. Everything's important. You sit in the mayor's office. Of course, everything's important. But really, is my work important? Is it helpful? I'd love to help you. But if it's not important, that's okay. I just need to know that. I need to know to stop pestering you with these calls for, you know, requests for proposals. I need to know if it is important. Oh my gosh, I actually did find an RFP we should apply to. Like, let me know. And Dan actually was one of those folks who chimed in and said, tell us what your real priorities are. And so I embarked on this project trying to figure out, can we actually articulate the questions that we have in question format that our academic partners might be able to answer either in whole or in part. What we pushed out, uh, and I, I've dropped a link in the chat here, um, is a 258 question booklet. And uh, we printed out real booklets and brought them with us to meetings. Uh, and we also published a PDF and you'll notice I like to draw people's attention to it says volume one. So we gave ourselves a mandate to try to do a second one at some point in time. Um, but these questions ended up actually interestingly being invitations to more than just academics. We had uh, everyone from sure academics and researchers, uh, but also folks from local think tanks folks from philanthropy come to us, folks from uh, students from classes, uh, but also high school students. We worked actually with a, a high school class uh, at um, one of the Boston Public Schools to answer three of these questions uh, that are in here directly. Um, and so really thinking of, oh, and I should not fail to mention that we also engaged individuals. So uh, my favorite story is, uh, you know, there's a series of questions here about winter in Boston, and there's a, an individual from Roslindale who randomly emailed us and somehow found our link and said, I'm Finnish, I have something to say about winters in Boston, I, can I come in and tell you? And she came in and gave us a 40 slide deck presentation on how to improve our winters, which I was like, this is amazing, right? Like this is not just an invitation for the folks who we intended, the academic audience, um, but it's actually an invitation for folks with any type of expertise to come in and help our government figure things out. Um, questions are a sign of vulnerability. It means that we're admitting we don't know something. And so it's an interesting thing to put out 258 questions and say, we don't know this, we don't have the capacity or maybe the expertise or skill set right now, please someone can you come and help us with something um, on this list and people do. Um, I think that that's one of those things where we put trust in our city to say, will you show up for us and people did. And they continue to do that. Um, moving forward, you know, over time, that was one experiment, one thing that we tried to do within local government. Uh, and at Bari, now that I've kind of brought this work over to Bari, the question has become, well, I don't sit in local government anymore, so I have nothing to say from that standpoint, but what can an academic institution do? Um, and so in the last year or so at Bari, we've really tried to figure out how do we use this tool that I developed for this one experiment uh, and modify it so that others could use it if they wanted to? And the best way to do that is to just put it in practice. And so what we did was we ended up working on about four different prototypes with four different communities and different configurations and said, this is a tool. How would you use it? What would that look like? Let's try to convene folks if that's helpful or if you want to take it and just go use it on your own, that's totally fine. We worked, as Dan mentioned, with folks in the affordable housing community, so a cross-sector community within Boston, 
group focused um, on understanding housing affordability and next step movement within that sector. And what they did was they they had folks from you know, real estate agents and developers to people from city and state government all the way down to, we had a, a tenants rights activist in the mix too. And they came to consensus on the same priorities that they all would like to see. The top three, I believe is what we came to that yes, across all of these sectors, we believe that these are the three priorities for us. We are all experts coming from different places. And we think that these top three are the things that we need to tackle. So that was one. We worked with uh, Boston Public Schools and their community hub schools, with Provi Providence Public Schools and their school committee. And we also worked with uh, a group uh, called Strategies for Children that is statewide here in Massachusetts, where we did a similar thing that we did with our affordable housing group. We brought in a bunch of different folks and they tried to come to consensus on what are the top, you know, three priorities that folks had. Well, that group in particular was very excited about this process and had me sit down with them and kind of walk them through what was it that we just did together. And uh, the outcome of that was they said to me, we're going to take this and we're going to take it to scale. We're going to go statewide, to which I said, wowie, uh, we've only tried this with small groups, but okay. Um, and the resulting factor there ended up being, and that's the next uh, click of the button there, and I'll simultaneously drop this in the chat, something called the Early Childhood Agenda, where uh, Dan mentioned this earlier, they, they worked for four months, so between October 2022, uh, and January 2023, it's it's hot off the presses. It's very recent. Um, statewide across Massachusetts, and they did in-person formats. They did a lot of online formats. They did a lot of daytime and evening formats to think about how do we engage truly from the ground up the level of expertise that the early childhood field across the state has. And this included folks who are you know, policymakers, folks who are legislators, folks who are advocates, folks who are doing kind of direct service work with either early childhood folks or families, and then early childhood folks, early childhood educators, and families themselves were also involved in this. And we had a uh, almost 2000, not quite 2000, but almost 2000. And, and that number is ticking up every day, because this is an ongoing process. It's something that doesn't just happen one time, but once you put something like this out, as we learned in, back in 2018, right? Once you put something like this out, people keep coming because people have different expertise, times change, and they, their expertise and knowledge can bring to bear in these key moments as, the, as you learn new things, as you uncover new questions, a lot of folks are happy to volunteer and identify like, I have something to say about this. I want to work on this. Um, the The latest update actually came from earlier today, when folks from the agenda started talking about how uh, they're going to formulate work groups. So there are ten priorities that folks came up with statewide. Already, these priorities are informing legislation um, and budgeting, uh, which we're in, currently in a budget process in Massachusetts. But beyond the policy level, there's a very practical, here's a set of things we need to get done. And so there are about 10 work groups, three of which have already formed and seven of which they're trying to get off the ground. Um, and so there, you see very clearly that this process moves these ideas of theory, these questions that people have very definitively into policy and into practice and action. Um, and that, again, that all happened for the early childhood agenda since October, um, and the full agenda wasn't released till January. And here we are in May where, okay, we're talking about what's the action step. So just to kind of reiterate the elements that go into these, you know, there's three elements and, and I'm going to hat tip to the folks at Strategies for Children who are the stewards of, of the agenda for uh, building out the third piece of this, which we didn't originally have in 2018. Um, but these three pieces are, and uh, they'll be the next three taps of the button, Dan, um, is really thinking about what partnership looks like, what uh, process looks like, and what the product is. Right. And the 
strategies for children folks are the ones who came up with, oh, pardon the doggy, um, are the ones who came up with the idea that actually all of this rests on partnership. Without partnership and a feeling of trust and safety and the fact that we're all working toward the same goal, um, that we won't be able to produce something that is useful. Uh, and the original two pieces of this uh, of the civic research agendas were really about process and product, which is about how do we do this? How do we surface these questions? Who do we have at the table? And what do we produce, right? Um, is it a book? Is it a PDF? Is it something that's online? Uh, is it an ongoing process? And that can be a product. And these are things that folks end up uh, really holding on to and being able to attach themselves to as they volunteer their time, efforts, energy, capacity, resources to being able to answer these questions. That is civic research agendas in a quick nutshell. And hopefully the doggy books weren't too loud while I explain those things, but happy to uh, kind of answer questions along the way. Okay, great. Okay. So, uh, so happy. Yes, we got uh, back to uh, great. And uh, I have to leave on the hour. So I'm going to uh, ask my question uh, first, if you don't uh, mind, first of all, so thank you uh, uh, so much. So amazing. Um, and my, my one question is, how can this be made unthreatening? There's so much sort of tech and science involved. Uh, how could it be made welcoming and unthreatening to people who are are just very um, far away from uh, uh, from that? I know that's essential. You know it too. We all know it. But how do you actually accomplish it so that people don't feel like they're being put under a microscope uh, or that, that they're just outgunned by experts, you know, that kind of thing, that they have the kind of equal footing that that they need to have? So how do you manage that? Kim, I'm trying to decide which of us should answer this because we both have answers to it. Uh, yeah, please both, and, please, please both give your and, answers. Well, I'm, just, I'm thinking order even because because we've done it at different scales and in different ways. I, I'm already talking, so I'll just start, and then Kim will <laughs> Kim will jump in. Um, I think, I, I mean, you raise a really important point, um, but I think it cuts both ways. I think data and tech can be scary, or they can be exciting, or they can be both. Right. And you have to figure out both things, right? You have to figure out what is the excitement? What is the value? What is the thing that that this community, that this population, that you, that this matters to, that you want to partner with um, and, you know, uh, find collaborations with? You got to figure out why they even want to come to the table and why talking to you as uh, in my case, a data guy or the, the person with the sensors, um, you know, why they even want to have that conversation. What is the value? And I think with the blue, I mean, the one I think the most about these days is the Blue Hill Avenue example, because we've been working on a lot right now. Um, it's, you know, the whole idea was built with community organizations where they were excited when we told them you can track hazards relevant to this housing plan that's occurring in your community that you're really concerned about, right? That this matters to you. And we have a tool that will help you. Um, and, and we're going to partner with you to do something alongside it. Uh, and quite frankly, there's, there's a woman we work with who's a community organizer from there. And she's, she's pretty blunt uh, with me often um, about like, you know, you're, the value you bring to the table is you're giving me a tool to support my community, to, to help my community overcome systemic racism. She, she says that in, in more or less the same words. Uh, and so she's really clear on that. And actually, it's really refreshing because it lets me know what she wants, why she's even at the table with us. Right. There's no ambiguity. We know exactly why she is engaging with us and she knows why we're engaging with her. Um, but she also is very clear with us. OK, we need to do outreach. We need to create a flyer. And that flyer, like she'll ask questions like, is are these sensors going to collect anything identifiable? And our answer is no, it's not. She's like that needs to be in bold in the middle of the flyer. 
right? That needs to be right there because my community needs to hear that because they've been surveilled for generations and they don't want to be surveilled. They just want data for their own purposes. Um, and and so then, so then I think it's I think it's both, right? You have to find the excitement point, and it's not so much evangelizing the excitement, like going door to door, like hey, we got this awesome thing. It's more having conversations with potential partners uh, about what the what the opportunities are. And I think what's nice about Bari as an infrastructure is we've, we've existed for long enough that we have those relationships already that we're not making cold calls, asking people to use our new fancy tool. We're in an ecosystem where we're rather active and these opportunities come to us. Sometimes we go out, you know, but but it's not cold calls. And so it makes it easier to find excitement that's that's organic um, and can be rooted in trust or existing partnership. Um, and it also allows us to have clear conversations about what are the fears here and how do we need to do well around them? Like, you know, legitimate fears about biased data. How are we going to work with biased data? How are we going to de-bias to the extent we can or be honest about the bias? You know, all those sorts of things that might come up. And so I, I think it's really engaging on both sides of that. Um, but I know Kim has done in some ways more of this than I have. I love for Kim to kind of, you know, elaborate from her perspective. Kim. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think from the work that I've done, first of all, I always tell folks like, don't use the words data or research, at least not up front, right? Like they're just so off-putting to like, I, my mom is my litmus test. If my mom is not interested, then how can I get other people interested? My mom is an average Joe person and like actually has buy-in to understanding what I do because she's my mom, right? Like, and she, if she's like lost with it, if she's not excited about it, if I can't get her there, then what, I'm not doing something correctly. Um, and one of the big things is like the words research, the words data, like these are just off-putting because we're socialized to, to either be research and data people or not. Um, and that's kind of not true, right? Like we are all research and data people, but I sit in a privileged position to be able to say that. Um, and I sit in a position to be able to say, I see that in you, you might not see that in yourself. So that's kind of the number one, like that was the first thing that I learned at City Hall when I was trying to engage the public around things that we were trying to push out as the city's open data manager or as the city's director of civic research, don't say anything <laughs> that's part of your title. Um, but the second thing that I'll say is, you know, and Dan kind of alluded to this, like there is a foundation of, we often talk about what is the foundation of trust, right? Um, I think one of the big things that we do as part of the civic research agenda process is kick off a day of, and you know, this is usually a group of folks who kind of know each other, but maybe in an adversarial form, like sometimes, right? When you got a real estate developer and a tenants rights person, uh, right, like in the same room, you might know each other, but maybe not the best place. How do you build a platform where it's not just about like, I can't ask everyone to trust one another. That seems silly. But what I can do is pr ask folks to create a safe environment to speak from their areas of expertise, right? Um, and if everyone can respect that, then at least we've got that and maybe we can build trust. And so there's a, a, a kind of pre-step that needs to happen before trust gets made um, that, especially for folks who may not yet trust one another, um, inclusive of trusting an academic institution or a government, like I work for institutions, right? Like we are not trustworthy people necessarily. Um, and so when we build out that space to just say, I need it to be safe for everyone to speak from their area of expertise, then we can move forward from there. And I think that Dan kind of alluded to that in terms of having longstanding relationships and, and doing that from a, a longer um, perspective. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. I'm uh, got to go. I look forward to uh, watching the rest of the Q&A on the recording. And so thank you so much, everybody. Bye bye. Hi, David. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, well, Kim and Dan, there are a couple of questions in the in the chat um, that you might want to address. Um, would you like me to read them out or do you have access to them right there? I see them. Um, 
Okay, so we've got from Vic Spindler Fox. Um, very interesting to hear you talk more in particular about trust building communities that have had their trust broken in the past. That's a which I think you a, that was yeah, Vic, you had posted that right around when you were just in support of the questions. Did you have yeah, and were you I would still like I'll, to hear more about it? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things, and I cannot take credit for this, right? Like um, the folks who did the early childhood agenda kept me on as an advisor, but they really took the model of a civic research agenda and just blew it out. And like I said, right, they added the partnership level to what this process really looks like. And so hat tip and credit to them. Uh, one of the things that they did that I love is uh, they included something called the Elevating Voices Continuum, which this is an old organizing principle that is an inclusive principle, but from their perspective, this is what, what it looks like, um, which is, you know, you assign folks a one, a two, a three. Um, right now, my uh, congressional representative is uh, Representative Ayanna Presley, and one of the things she's famous for saying, and like she didn't coin the term, but she says it a lot, is the people closest to the pain should be closest to the paper. And this continuum is something that, in conjunction with the early childhood agenda process, actually produced a, a way for folks who are closest to that pain. And so, in this scenario, it was families and early educators themselves um, to speak first. So there was always a place where we knew everyone was going to get a chance to talk, but just in case, right, we're going to let the folks who feel it the most talk first. And I actually sat in on a lot of the meetings where they were formulating their agenda. And uh, it was a remarkable thing. We were like maybe two or three meetings in. It wasn't that far in. Um, and, you know, you're on Zoom. Everyone's got their Zoom hands up. And uh, someone calls on a person. And this person says, oh, um, well, as you can see, I'm a three. Um, and so I'm just waiting for all the ones to talk. And then just muted themselves, right? Like, and that was like, they had already built that norm into that. And that was a really cool thing to see two meetings in where a three would just kind of step back and say like, no, it's, I, I'm a three, obviously, right? Like there's there's ones that need to talk right now. Um, and so those kinds of, of mechanisms that you can build into meeting facilitation um, and, and just making sure that the way you interact, right, the process, the how is really intentional in making sure that those those different power dynamics are one acknowledged, but two addressed, right? Um, those are really important things. So that's maybe my my add on for uh, my expanded answer, Vic. In case that's helpful, I I love that. I love that. Thank you. I'm thank you, Vic, for asking for more. Um... Yeah, there's uh, so the um, you have folks in the conference room uh, asking how essential is working with uh, government. That's uh, that's a fun question. Um, it's a fun question. I I'm gonna give you my answer. I I can't wait to hear Kim's answer. Um, <laughs> uh, but I mean it's essential, right? If you're going to have a complete conversation. You got to have government involved, right? Government holds probably like in community, in a community context, in a municipal context, government holds probably the lar is probably the largest employer um, or one of the largest employers. Um, it holds basically it manages all of the administrative systems for the municipality. Uh, and it has, I mean, as one of my colleagues who has worked in government and worked in academia likes to say, we don't have money until we do. Um, like there's lots of resources, but there's also no resources ever anywhere. Um, and yet there's tons of resources somewhere. Um, but one way or another, the government has more resources than a non a local nonprofit uh, does uh, and more not necessarily flexibility is the right word, but more capacity to move that around in, in service of priorities uh than than you know other organizations do so with that all said you you gotta have them involved at some level 
um and and you want them involved at some level because otherwise they become irrelevant or intransigent and neither one of those is helpful um and for truly really trying to get things done they can they they have levers that others can't pull um so so i think it is essential what's been really fascinating to me and this kind of gets to vic's question a little bit too so with the common census project this is the first time I've been fully in this position where the collaboration is explicitly city university community, right? There are explicitly city agencies and local nonprofits and academics working together on the team. It was really interesting when we started was I started to realize that the city was really anxious, like really anxious about this arrangement because they couldn't manage the relationship with the academics and the relationship with the nonprofits separately from each other, which is what they do historically, right? Um, and not to overly, overly stereotype their stereotyping, but when one of them or the other one gets kind of out of line with what the city needs as a political entity, right? The academics can be kind of written off as nerds. And so, okay, well, they went too far with the nerdy thing. Okay, let's just keep going in this direction. Um, and when the nonprofits get kind of angry, reminding the city that like a lot of injustices have occurred around here, <laughs> listen to us, right? They, they can sidebar that conversation as well, right? And at least contain it to where they're comfortable having it. But here's a circumstance where the other two organizations are suddenly talking to each other, right? And and that's really worrisome. And I think we've gotten to a point where we've we've mapped out the shared understanding of what we are doing together. And we've also made the nonprofits made it very clear up front what they were pissed off about. And like just put that on the table and we worked through that. There was a meeting where we didn't talk anything about the science or what we're going to do together scientifically. We just listened to the nonprofits tell the city what was up. Um, and the fact that we all sat through that meeting and no one got into an actual fight allowed us to have the next meeting. Right. Um, and so we got there eventually. But I just think without without city involved, you're you're missing one of your crucial anchor institutions for the community. Uh, and so you kind of need them involved, um, but it, it's a delicate balancing act. And, and it comes back to Vic's point that not all relationships between the city and the community are good or have historically been good. And you have to, you have to figure out how to acknowledge that and then move forward with the task at hand together. Uh, and it's tricky. And speaking of someone, it's funny that David's not here anymore, right? David, David trained me as a scientist and kind of threw me out into the world um into Binghamton and so right speaking of someone who's trained originally as an evolutionary biologist right it is very it, it, it's always eye-opening every time and it's been eye-opening for 15 years of every time being like huh okay well that's another thing that's not the science that I need to do better or do differently or just do um and and then you just have to do it uh I don't know Kim what's, what's your take uh, as I've as I've gone on a random diatribe what is your take on whether the city is essential or not um in academia, we always talk about fitting our method to the question, right? Like, it, what's your question? And depending on what your question is, that's how you're going to identify maybe your one, your two. There, there's possibly multiple pathways to answering that question, but you've got to pick one if you're one person, right? Like, you can't do them all, all at once. And so you also can't do all of the methods. They're probably not all of the methods are applicable. And in the same way, I think working with government is, I don't know, what's the goal? Um, sometimes it is actually really useful to, to Dan's point to have a trusting relationship with someone in government so that they can tell you whether or not government will be useful to you or will be a roadblock. Um, and in fact, you know, I very distinctly remember this. There was um, a really cool local dude and he, he's a, a huge math guy, first and foremost, um, but also a street artist. And in, if you've ever come into Boston and if you especially go into some of our local neighborhoods, whether like schools, especially elementary schools, on occasion, you'll find a, a street mural, like quite literally on the sidewalk, and it'll be math based. And that's this guy. Um, and he's a very cool dude. He's done this like in a couple different cities all around. Um, some of his stuff has made it to other cities. And he came to us one day at the mayor's office and said, I want to do this more in Boston. 
is there a mechanism here that will help get me funding and the permits that I need to just like put them down and put them in more neighborhoods? And we were like, yeah, actually, this is really cool. You do really cool stuff. Our office looked into it and then we realized really quickly, oh yeah, so if you work with us, you're gonna need to go to this office, this office and this office and pull these different permits. If you work with us, your murals will have to fit this size and this shape because that's what we do. If you work with us, you're gonna need to work with this public works person on their schedule, on their time to install appropriately. You're gonna need to use this specific paint. You're gonna need, and we were just like, you know what, don't work with us. <laughs> you did your stuff guerrilla style and it looks cool. No one's complained. We get what you're doing. It's it's not harmful. It's all safe. Just go and please don't tell us any more about it. <laughs> so depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Those were two and very different and wonderful responses <laughs> to that question. Um Thank you. Thank you both. I know, Sage, you had said you can ask a question, too. Um, no, he can't. I, I know. I'm wondering, what's he, what do you mean by, of course you can, Sage. You can always <laughs> ask a question. You always can come up with something. Yeah. Does Sage, anyone else can, have a question, I Gavin? We're in. <laughs> May I? <laughs> <laughs> Should we give Gavin and Lauren a chance? Uh, no, go for it. Whoever, whoever would like to jump in. <laughs> Um, you go and then I'll ask my question afterwards. Okay, great. Um, I, I was thinking about like how to phrase this question, um, mainly as uh, uh, advice. So I think there's a sense in that the role of institutions like Bari or Post Social World um, or any of these various organizations that there's this shift. Um, of being stakeholders just the same in the system, not just being outside facilitators, but having a vested interest in the system itself. So it's like that question of how do we work together to do this um, in the very like located sense. Um, and I guess one, one thing that's interesting though for organizations like us is that we do have a particular set of processes and methods and tools to offer um and so one thing that i think we're we're still learning and and maybe there's a thought here is like how do how do you offer that package um and then also leave it open for that to be you know rejected in the negative it's not helpful just like why should we work with government it's like well why should you work with us like uh maybe we're not that helpful right now but then how do you still support the process because you have a vested interest in the system, not just your role in it. So it's like, you want to let uh, stakeholder ones speak first, but you're also like, I think we could help here and maybe, you know, but maybe not. It's like, that's a delicate dance. And um, so it's like, we're, we're constantly struggling with that uh, dichotomy of like having something of authority to offer and then also being totally humble about its relevance, just, from your from your seeing pro social world from sort of the outside in, I was wondering what you thought. Maybe some cultural transmission. Yeah. I'll jump. Jim, in. do you want to lead? Yeah. <laughs> um. I often ask folks. So you let's say you have a friend and you're listening to them talk through a problem in their life and maybe you've gone through it before and maybe you have experience with it. Maybe you actually have a skill or a knowledge that could be useful. So and how do you do that? How do you offer what you have in those spaces? And it's it's the same thing, right? Like it's the same of there's a gentleness that exists and an understanding of at the outset, I'm here to listen. And particularly for institutions, I think there's there needs to be an understanding that there's an imbalance in power dynamic um, and sometimes a history of that. Um, 
that you just have to know and be in context with. So like understanding and being embedded in that context allows for you to have the faculty and even the level of code switching needed to be able to navigate those conversations. So I don't think there's a prescriptive like how, but more of that like here's a set of things that you should be aware of as you consider what you have to offer. And that assumes, so that's the second thing I was gonna say, is that you've got something to offer, which means that before you offer something, you've got to know what you can offer and what you can't, both of those things. Both of those things are really important. Um, when you understand your own limitations, you're on your own boundaries, then you can stop yourself from being the know-it-all, being the like, oh, I know about like, okay, no one cares what you know about, we wanna know what you have, right? Um, and so like, that that allows you to understand, okay, I can offer you this. For example, I can offer you a civic research agenda, but know that it's in pilot phase and I've never done this statewide. So I can help you think through how you might do this because I can help you think through how I might do this, um, but there's no known. And if what you need is a known, tried trusted true thing maybe this tool is not a good one um right like that's that's a you're able to give the limitations of your work up front so that people can make informed choice um and choose and that that's actually a trust building measure right like oh wow okay like <clears throat> you know yourself well enough that maybe i can trust what you're saying and what you're offering here yeah um, excellent response. Yeah, it, it's hard to, mm -hmm. to go to um, go out and, and not really know what you have to offer. How do you gain trust when you don't really even know what you're bringing to the table? <laughs> mm -hmm. Go ahead, Dan. And I think I think the one thing I think that's exactly right. And I think Kim really articulated it well. Uh, the only thing I would add in knowing pro social world and its kind of context is what is your ecology? Right. Who who to whom are you offering things and how do you build a network with those with with those institutions, with those people? Right. In some ways, in some ways, Kim and I have a very naturally we have a very organic um, context because we're, we're in a city. Right. And that city is well defined, and we want to go regional. Well, then we just expand the definition, right, geographically. And as Sage knows, Greater Boston can be defined seventeen different ways, uh, you know. But we always have we always have a network that exists that we can that we're active in, but we can also expand or or mine or Google search and find our way to the places that we need to be to be creating those relationships. I think the question for pro social world is who's your audience, right? And who's your, who's your, yeah, what is the definition of, or what is the criterion of groups that you can help effectively and that you want to be on their radar so that those natural conversations happen, right? That you're hanging out with someone and they're like, hey, you know, I was worried about this thing. And then Sage, you can be like, oh, that sounds exactly like this thing that we're doing over here. Or, you know, David said this yesterday, or Ian is working on this, or Beth, you know, was suggesting the following programming. And that matches really well with what you're doing. But you kind of, to have trust and to have sort of not be a cold calling entity, you have to be constantly moving through those rooms and you have to be setting yourself up to move through those rooms. Um, and yeah, I think that's, I think it's a big piece. And, you know, Bari only started because when I was hired as a postdoc, I was told like, go, just, just go and find everybody. Um, and then, you know, we built a, a thing around that, that was a community. And then the conversations are natural. And I think what you have to do is sort of identify and build out your ecosystem. I, that's, that's exactly it. The, the difference of a geographic versus like a, your motivation, goal-oriented, like network, but we often find ourselves linking up because if your main aggregation is based on like a shared vision or goal, and you just are like so excited, and then like six months later, you're like, we really have nothing to actually do together. Uh, we're just aiming for the same thing, and so you know how you figure out 
that process in a way that doesn't take six months and sort of just like playing in the sandbox. It's a, definitely an art and uh, um, I, I, I feeling, I'm feeling like some part of it besides the geography is like Bari keeps reinventing the signal that it puts out, you know, civic research is a more pointed kind of way of putting it and attracts a different audience. Um, and I think we'll have to figure out how to do that when ours is often very like paradigmatic in terms of like a scientific perspective uh, and end process. Yeah. Well, thank you. Lauren, did you have, uh, would you like to, we have um, just a couple more minutes, but would you like to ask your question? Sure, yeah. So this is just a more kind of general methods question. Um, but Kim, when you were going through the um, civic agenda setting, is there a certain strategy or process that you use to generate those 250 questions? Uh, I'm definitely very, I'm not in the policy world at all. So I would just love to hear a little bit more about that. It was the worst strategy, um, which I would not do again, um, right? So the original was me sitting down with all of my colleagues and quite literally asking them to do a little homework beforehand and come with questions. And what we did was we talked through each of the questions that they brought in that were outstanding. So all I did was say, what are your outstanding questions where you could use help from the outside? Um, right. No one, no one in this institution, no one here at city government has yet been able to or will not be able to answer these questions. Right. So bring those in. Um, and so then I sat down with each and every one of them and understood what they meant by the questions and in real time configured their questions to say, like, OK, so when you say and this is not this was not a real question, but like when you say, how do we solve poverty? what do you mean by that? Because that's not a research question. Like that's not an answerable thing that we can wrap our heads around, right? And so how do we, I, I physically and like in person sat with folks and moved them toward research questions if you've got those six months to do that. Oh, wow. Um, which, I just am exhausted just thinking about it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like we had we had 11 people on the team. And so that was a long time. And it did. It took me a year to figure that out. And then we member checked it all and said, can you not just look over these final questions, but bring them to the partners that you work with internal and external to make sure they're OK questions for us to push out. And we actually did not. We had more than 258. Um, but some of them didn't make it in for the final publication. Um, what we've done since then, as we've thought about like, what's the tool that we can provide and put out there um, and, and work with communities to figure this out. Um, we've learned how to have the conversations so that they themselves lift up their own priorities. And in fact, uh, doing it in a group setting um, is much more efficient and way faster. We've learned that we could do a good chunk of this work in about I don't know, four hours um, with a half day, right? Like a little breakfast, little lunch at the end so that we're all fueled up. Um, but like we can do a good chunk of this work in four hours collectively, but you do need that foundation of like safety, a little bit of trust and the ability for people to come in ready to think about what do they want to know and uh what are their priorities? Um, they need to be able to stand firm in their expertise to be able to participate like that. That makes so much sense. Um, and then one more question. Were you working for the city before this project started or did you come in kind of new into the position? Oh yeah, I was a fellow in 2015 and we started this work in 2017 um, and pushed it out uh, April, 2018. But most of the 2018 work was actually me working with a civic designer and her figuring out like the like for her, the medium is the message. And so really thinking like, actually, this is one thing that I didn't talk about. Um, working with a civic designer helped shift the frame of the entire thing so that it was more approachable for people beyond academia, um, because she came into it being like, so these questions can be answered by really anybody. 
And I was like, you're right. Oh, no, we can't have sociology questions and theater questions and, you know, biology questions. We've got to have and and we can't have transportation questions or education questions. So if you flip through, they're not categorized by any of those siloed areas on purpose. Um, and that was all of her her doing and her her understanding of how to create and position these things. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Those good questions, Elaine. Well, we've got one more one more minute. I do want to just say that that was uh, an incredible presentation. You guys are doing incredible work. I'm just so excited that you were able to do this. I learned so much more of what uh, what all you've done. And one of my favorites is this elevating voices continuum. The that your one two threes. Um, that that one that that's I think is just a really usable and equitable method, and I'm, I appreciate you sharing the the links that you shared in the in the chat. Um, and um, thank you, Vic. Thanks for being here, um, Gavin or uh, anyone. Hey, else? Obi. Have, anyone have any last final words? No. Okay. That was excellent, though. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Gavin. And your puppy did not, uh, wasn't, it wasn't he, too loud. It wasn't disruptive on our end. It but just squelches you know. your audio and you sound like you're in a little can. <laughs> That's true. It did. Yeah. <laughs> Disappointed when I don't hear puppy barks in meetings. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you all so much. I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the day. And this will uh, send the recording out and be posted. Mm -hmm on YouTube. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for having us, Beth. Thanks, everyone. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.